All right, welcome back folks. I'd like to start with another quote. Money is like love. It kills slowly and painfully the one that withholds it and enlivens the other who turns it on his fellow man. So I imagine a lot of folks are probably like, hey Chris, uh, I thought the podcast was about health and wellness, so why are we talking about money? Which podcast? The Zen Meathead podcast. Uh -huh. I kind of figured this far, and people probably, <laughs> well, it's still probably good to mention know, it. but you know, for most of us, we've, we've had some money issues in life, and uh, they're gross, they're painful. Um, so we brought in a friend today um, who has a fascinating story. Welcome, Nelia. Thank you. So we've seen you on a few other podcasts recently. Uh, we've been aware of the business you've been in for a while. Um, I didn't realize exactly what it was you were up to. So I want to I want to get to what it is that you're up to these days. But I wanted to start out with the, the introductory story. I had no idea that you were a first generation immigrant and like <laughs> made it from nothing. So I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, how you ended up here and moved towards what you're doing today. Yeah, no, thank you for having me here. Where do we start? <laughs> you, right? Just jump right there was in. so much to talk about. Thanks for having me here, yes, by the way. Thank you. Absolutely. Really excited. Thanks for coming. We're going to talk about this. is going to be fun. Um, where did I start? I moved here in 1995 from former Soviet Union, Tajikistan. And, you know, 90s, early 90s when the country fell apart. Yeah. In fact, when I moved here, I was citizen of nowhere for five years, kind of like the movie Terminal. Wow. <laughs> oh, oh, so you weren't even a citizen in your home country at that point. Yeah. Nowhere. You citizen of nowhere. Wow. That's another new thing people didn't know about me. I, I learned it today. <laughs> that can be possible. Yeah. I uh, had my old passport. I still have my old Soviet Union passport, but we couldn't travel like other than within the U.S. Couldn't even go to Canada for five years until I got my... Well, I got my green card three years in, and then five years in is when we got our citizenship. You know, we moved on refugee status uh, because of the war that we had that broke out there, civil war. Over 100,000 people died. You know, I was 19 when I moved. So it's not like a five-year-old that you can mold into this country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, I sound like a victim now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, and even uh, you and I had talked earlier, like uh, the fact that it isn't widely talked about that there was this civil war. Yeah. So that was never mentioned here. You know, it's kind of like not a big deal, whatever it is, it is. But uh, we came as refugees. We were on public assistance, meaning like on welfare uh, for the first. So my parents were for nine months. And because I was over 18, I had my own little $700 check that I was getting from the government. I was on public assistance, I want to say for seven months, I can't remember exactly. But that's that time frame is like, you're supposed to go to college, learn English, get up on your feet and get going. <laughs> it's like, that's what that time is there for. So did you speak any English when you moved? No, I didn't speak any English when I moved here. Wow. I have this wonderful story I like to talk about. Um, so my parents hired a tutor before we moved here, three months before we moved here, my dad hired an English tutor. They're like, yeah, let's have her take classes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we hop on a plane, we flew from Tajikistan to Moscow, Moscow to New York, New York to Salt Lake City, Salt Lake City to Seattle. So in New York, I think it's world, some world organization, whatever, we didn't even have money to buy our tickets. They paid for it and then you make like $25 payments throughout thousand years to pay it off <laughs> till the end of time <laughs> till the day you die but um so they met us in new york took us through customs we did everything but the problem is we now have to fly to salt lake city salt lake city we had to connect to seattle nobody speaks english so we have this army of immigrants behind me and my dad's like i have a great idea she had a tutor she speaks english i was like say what i don't speak english <laughs> so here i am like moses with tons of people behind me <laughs> And the lady pulls me over. She's like, okay, you take your ticket, you find somebody in a uniform, you walk up to them and you just say Seattle. I was like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> you know, so I run up to this whomever in a uniform and I show them my ticket. I'm like, Seattle. And then they're like, like Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> so they put us on the little trolleys and they took us to our gate and we're here. <laughs> nice. That's the extent of how much English I knew. Wow. Yeah. 
That was a long-winded answer, too. Well, when I mean, you were 19. <laughs> I was 19. Wow. That's just, uh, I can't even imagine, like, coming to a new country. Like, when we travel, when it's not English speaking, it's just like, uh, it's really overwhelming. But, you know, we're there traveling with lots of people to help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not trying to build a new life. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and we also have an app on our phone that helps us yeah. translate stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's really true. Need to. Now we, we just, do. Yeah. So, clunky. So, didn't, like... You know, kind of started with English. I learned a lot of it by watching TV. Um, I, I'll tell you this. I'm not made for school. Mm -hmm. Over the years, I learned that. that I did Cheers. not do it. <laughs> you. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do well in a classroom environment. I just suffocate. It just kills me. I mean, nothing wrong with people that love to study or power to you. I'm just not built that way, I suppose. I took classes at community college, it was driving me crazy. A couple uh, classes later, I dropped off and I would just turn on TV, watch it with subtitles. By the way, fun fact, to this day, I have to have subtitles. <laughs> Still? To this day. <laughs> My husband was like, do you not understand? I'm like, yeah, I need them. <laughs> yeah, I don't do know why I house, still yeah. have to have them. Yeah. But, um, you know, and then just cut a little article from the newspaper, whatever it is, write the words I didn't know, put them on sticky notes throughout the house, and then go back to the article, reread it, and see if I can grasp the content, move to the next article, next paragraph. Wow. That's how I learned. It was more like, okay, I can do it on my own terms. You're not telling me what to do. <laughs> Not in a classroom. Yes, not in a classroom. We're not doing that. So you show up at 19, uh, government assistance, mm -hmm. uh, and somewhere between there and today where you are mm -hmm. in the real estate game, um, what were the next steps? I, you know, you mentioned, uh, ironically, we've had a number of guests on uh, who either came from or still actively working with the pro club. And ironically, in our pre-meeting, you were like, you realize I worked at the pro club, too? Yeah. I was like, no, I didn't. So <laughs> funny. <laughs> so I right. bounced around a lot. I worked at Refugee Federation because coming as a refugee, I, did, I was a counselor at age 19 for like all these immigrants and refugees, teaching them how to open bank accounts and find jobs without speaking any English. That was my job to get them off public assistance and move them on to the next level of their life. And um, hated that. Actually, I liked it. I didn't hate it too much. But bureaucracy was a little bit too much to handle. Yeah. Um, and then I was a dental assistant for a couple of years. And then I was an esthetician at Pro Club. And, you know, tried that for, I want to say, Esthetician, I was about eight years, but at Pro Club, I worked for five. Yeah. And then transitioned on to real estate in 2007. So when you jumped into the real estate game, um, I assume you did the, the fairly generic route of like selling single, single family home type stuff? So when I joined in 2007, if you remember May of 2007, market. Not a good time. <laughs> no, no, but hey, I thought it was an amazing time to join <laughs> because market was hot and hopping and it was just starting to take a dive. Um, I did not sell anything for my first year. And then a lot of the short sales were coming. Like there was a lot of chatter, short sales, Mako and short sales. I'm like, what is that? I just kept digging more into it. Agents were saying, I don't want to do short sales. I don't want to be an advocate. There's too many legal aspects and hoops that I have to jump through. I'm like, wait, if they don't want to sell short sales, banks are going to need agents. They're going to end up with these homes. They're going to need agents to sell these properties. I was like, I'm going to go up to the, I, mean, I was so dumb. I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> so I called, called banks and I got in to sell their bank home properties. So about a year into it, Bank of America, HSBC, Deutsche Bank, HUD, VA, like you name it, they were my clients. So just from cold calls, you managed to get in to... The gates were open and they were doing it, but it wasn't like widely advertised. They didn't want like... Everybody. But then agents also didn't want to deal with the legalities of it because it was such a new aspect, such a new thing. Nobody knew what it was. I'm like, I think this is going to be a big deal. So I kind of jumped into it. Mm -hmm. So all the work that nobody wanted to touch because it didn't. And, and pre-2007, these folks were probably making huge money, you know, selling a number of houses a year. They're, they're doing Tons very well money. for themselves. And they, yeah. They, they don't want to jump through hoops. And Who wants to put up with all the bureaucracy of 
Yeah, nobody wanted to. It's a lot of work, I won't lie to you, because as a bank owned agent, I was in charge. Like when you come in, people still live in these homes, even though the bank that the house was foreclosed on. Yeah. So my job was, you know, um, here's cash for key. You have whatever, 60, 90 days to move out. If you move out, leave it in a broom clean condition, you're going to get X amount of dollars. Like managing all the pre-listing and then during listing and then post, that was all one person job. Like, wow. And agents were just like, let's go shop around. And yeah. that wasn't a concept people were familiar with or wanted to do. Yeah. So, yeah. So you start out in the uh, the repo business, if mm -hmm. you will, of, uh, of home loans, mm -hmm. um, mostly single? Single families mainly, at yes, that, at, that, at point. that time, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, my limited experience with mm -hmm. real estate and having you know, owned two or three homes, mm -hmm. how, depending on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> you've talked about something that's interesting and new to me mm -hmm. um, in terms of real estate investing. My idea of real estate investing is, you know, we own a home now, we're going to go try to buy one across the street and rent it ideally for the same or more than the mortgage is. Mm -hmm. You have a slightly different angle you're playing, mm -hmm. um, where it's, you know, duplexes, quads, uh, small apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how people get into that. So, like I said, coming from where I'm at, I want to go buy the house across the street. It's going to cost me a million dollars. You know, I have to come up, you know, depending on credit, I'm going to come up with a big chunk of change to put down all this stuff. How do people manage to break into that market where... I want to buy a duplex. I want to buy a small apartment complex, and I don't have you know five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars sitting around in my bank account. Mm -hmm. So when you buy duplex, triplex, fourplex, your financing is very similar to what you do for a single family home. Okay, it's the same lender you're going to go to. They're not technically considered commercial loans. Yep. It's technically a conventional loan. You still go through the same lender you went through to buy your property you are willing to spend million dollars on a home here across the street where I'm saying, time out, don't do that. Let's take you 30 minutes south. Let's buy you a fullplex where you spend 900,000. And instead of renting this thing for $4,000 a month where you just spend million dollars, let's have you make a little extra on cash flow. Let's say we bought an offer just for whatever, random for place, easy, yeah. random place, we'll get a name. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get a duplex there for about mid eights, mm -hmm. right? Okay. To high nines, depends on what the rents are and depends on what the finishes are there. And now your two bed, one bath unit, each side is at least gonna rent for $2,000 a month. So 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 times four, where are we at, um, eight, eight, eight grand. grand. Right, you're not going to rent your Bellevue home for no eight way. grand that you just paid a million for. Mm -hmm. Interesting. To the math. Yeah, no, that you don't have to be a genius. And that's far more interesting. <laughs> uh, actually, one of the the shorts I watched of one of your recent podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, you were you were talking about that idea. You know, there was a guy that was talking about I'm going to nurse this thing along for four or five years in hopes that I'm going to make four or five hundred thousand dollar return. And like you said, like I don't know what the market's going to look like in four or five years. Like. Why not make nobody knows three or four grand a month every month? Like that seems very compelling to me. Mm -hmm. And even and people go, well, what if the market adjusts and what if the rates go down? Excellent, let them. I'm still not bringing any money out of my pocket. You yeah. know, instead of eight grand, I might be making I don't know five thousand. Still a thousand dollars in my pocket better than putting four grand out of my pocket into this deal, mm -hmm. dumping, because yeah. one day it will appreciate. I don't know. I think because I started in 2007 and I watched people lose their properties, my mentality is a little different. I don't like to bet on appreciation. Sure, it will appreciate. I'm sure it will appreciate. Yeah, but at what rate? Right. And when? And, when? And, and like, there's too much variables and too much uncertainty for me to go that route. Well, as well, like you said, the, you know, we buy the house across the street, um, we lose a tenant and for whatever reason can't rent it for a period of time, we're covering the whole mortgage. Exactly. You yep. lose one renter in a fourplex, mm -hmm. like, yes, we're losing some money maybe, but we still have, you know, They're a still flow. paying some of your mortgage down, some of your landscaping down, some of the maintenance down, because you got three other people, even if you're 50% vacant. 
yeah. you're still okay. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So that's approach I've been taking and that's what I've been teaching a lot of my investor clients. Well, that's interesting. You've been talking about uh, teaching a little bit. Like I said, the, the podcast you saw recently, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. You were, uh, you're teaching uh, this type of investing to a lot of uh, sports folks, like mm -hmm. football players, mm -hmm. etc. I'm trying to remember, what was, what was the guy's name? Oh, the football player? Cliff? Cliff. Yeah, we did a podcast together. Yes, that was yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I can't remember his name. I'm yeah, looking yeah. at his face. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're always on top of sports ball I'm, stuff. I'm always on top of sports ball. <laughs> it's the math that fogged his head right, right. now. Yes, yeah, I got we'll say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. So, so now you're teaching uh, this, this type of investing, this, you know, buy apartment complexes, but maybe even, do you reach into commercial as well, or...? So they don't necessarily have to buy apartment complexes. You know, a lot of people, I mean, you can start anywhere. You can buy a condo, you can buy a single family home. You know, there's plenty of ways to make money at the end of the day. It's just, what is your comfort level? Yeah. Where do you want to step into? If For newer investors, I don't necessarily take them into apartment complexes. Like when I say apartment complexes, I'm talking about like, 10 units plus yeah like a new investor comes in we sit down we talk i'll have you dip your toes at like a triplex and or fourplex to see even if you like that game yeah right i provide like everything like all my contractors all my attorneys you know the whole system in place like this is what we're going to do this is how we're going to do it i provide all of that so you're a one-stop shop then yeah i mean it doesn't make sense to you know because if you don't succeed at the end of the day you're not going to want to buy again True. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So I look at the bigger picture. It's like, okay, this is what we're buying. This is how you're going to stabilize this building. This is how much money you're going to make. It's going to take you X amount of times to get there. And then by the time your second and third comes rolling, you're a pro at it. Like, you don't really need me. Mm -hmm. You know, we just do the contract. You deal with and the legal stuff yeah. and paperwork. And, and then you already know how to find tenants, screen tenants, sign your leases, and manage your property. Well, that's a, another thing that scares me about like jumping into the rental game. While I love like you know you talk about mm -hmm. you know a fourplex, it's like mm -hmm. wow that seems really appealing to mm -hmm. me. Now, as a young man, uh, I spend a little bit of time in the apartment complex business myself as a maintenance person. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> seeing what people did to buildings, as well as even the apartment complex game back in that time frame, in the late nineties, uh, getting somebody out who wasn't paying their rent was a pain in the butt. It still is. Yeah, and, and people are animals. Some uh, of them, <laughs> like they're dirty and destructive, and ooh. we were just talking about it today. I'm like, I did my remodel nine years ago. I'm like, I just have few scuff marks, but I don't have to like freaking tear it down to the spot. Some of yeah. my tenants, you have to, yeah, yeah. But again, look at it as this is business. Kick your emotions out the door. You know that's. The mentality it takes a certain type of human i guess to I, look at things i think way. i would struggle with that you know um i will come back to it but uh why this happens i envision you know owning a place and here's a, a single mother with a child or two and stuff gets hard and she can't make the rent it's like my heartstrings are getting pulled on like i don't want to throw this woman out but on the same note i have to pay the bank for that mortgage and it's like I bought this in, as an investment. I need you to honor your part of the deal. So there are actually options. I don't necessarily kick people out right away. There are options that I provide. Here's Salvation Army. Here are a couple churches that will help you with the rent. There's places that I refer my tenants to. I mean, I don't work with my tenants anymore that my property manager will have access to. Yeah. Like City will provide um, rent will help with rent to people that are struggling and or falling behind. Like during COVID, we had a lot of that also. Mm -hmm. So we give them a chance before we kick them out to the curb. Yeah. You know, but then there is always only so much you can do for someone. Sometimes they just need that lesson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we oftentimes will provide resources, we'll provide places for them to go to, to get help, to put them back up on their feet. I don't necessarily kick them off right away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and that's good. Um, so I've circled around it a, a number of times, and I keep finding myself not able to, to speak of it. So you have a book upcoming. Okay. <laughs> I understand it. Uh, I love how she says, okay. 
I've read most of it, so I'm pretty sure you have a book I've come from. Yeah. Real estate investing, nothing held back. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this, because some of these stories that I was, you know, talking about or circling around were from from the book. Mm -hmm. You read it. What do you think? I love it. Um, it's just a no nonsense. It's you know, other than the the math the section. <laughs> you paused for a minute. You read it past math. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's wonderful. I adore it. Um, and in fact, it gets me like. I'm excited about it now. I wish that I had more money to play with right now because I'm mm -hmm. like, this sounds interesting. <laughs> as well as the fact, I think that's something, especially in this day and age with, you know, big tech layoffs, all kinds of crazy stuff going on that are affecting people's financial situations. I'm starting to recognize that having all of your eggs in one basket is a very dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. um, so having something like a home or an apartment complex or something where Hopefully, once it's all dialed in, it's just generating monthly revenue for mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. Passive that's income. Mm -hmm. Passive income. Like mm -hmm. That's where it's at. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, but um, going back to what you're talking about in terms of, of renting, now that we're the, now that the book's out of the bag, so to speak, um, one of the things that I wrote down that you said in the book is, you don't need to be mean, but you also don't have to be nice. And so, like that that mentality of um, having boundaries and making sure that you're respecting your own boundaries in mm -hmm. these situations and what are you okay with dealing with and how many months are you able to, um, to float somebody having a hard time before you have to say enough is enough. I would really love to help you, but we've hit the threshold, like that kind of thing. So two, two months in usually is when I know they need help because mm -hmm. if they're late two months, they're never catching up. It's yeah. just not gonna happen. You know, then we sit down, we have come to Jesus moment meeting, right? What are we doing? Where are you at? Why are you struggling? Like, and we have those conversations with every single tenant. You know, with my property manager, we meet once a month on the phone where we go over every single unit on the 20th usually of each month by the 20th they should be able to be paid up mm -hmm. and their balance needs to be at zero and if it's not i want to know why if it was not paid last month why have they not paid this month you know are they willing to get help from all the resources that we have provided there's certain steps we go through mm -hmm. that are not excellent let's trigger eviction yep you know, sometimes the parents kick in and they're like, oh, I'll pay for my child. And then the parents are like, I'm not paying for this bum. Yeah. What does yeah. that tell you? <laughs> like, yeah. There's no saving there. Mm -hmm. And the longer you wait, now you're six months in before they get evicted. So you kind of want to mitigate a lot of this stuff before it's too late. Yeah. Well, that process takes a while too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot, of, a lot of my secrets are spilled in that book. I literally... I think it's a perfect name for it. Nothing yeah. held back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I love that it's so perfectly your voice. Like we've known each other for quite <laughs> for a while. while yeah. And uh, when I when I read it, it's it's you. It's like that's you. That's yeah. her. I can hear your voice reading it. I'm Multiple like, people <laughs> told me that. But what I find interesting, you guys are the first ones that read the edited final version. Mm -hmm. Everybody else I've had, I've had eight people read it, like my beta readers, and. They were like, oh, you're a little rougher on the edges here. You may want to think, oh, that's not okay to yeah. say in America. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Did, did you actually make any of those? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I was going to say, I haven't read You read, read the final, like, I haven't read done. anything yet where I was like, ooh, you shouldn't say that. Well, it was more like, I'm not going to repeat it since it's not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but in my industry, so... It's a hostile industry towards women, mm -hmm. and I was very vocal about it, so I got rid of it. Oh, it was gotcha. more. It was more of, here's factual data. This is how you do it. This is how you go about when you hit this obstacle. You mm -hmm. know, and we're not going to talk about certain people being jerks. So let's just move past that. I'm okay with it. So yeah, maybe it. when you decide to retire from the industry, you put out the the second provision, the tell all, which includes the uh, dudes can be assholes. Yeah. <laughs> and ironically, not just dudes. Yeah. yeah. There's some women that can be, uh, yeah. Real bulldogs, mm, too. Not so nice. Yeah, not so nice. Probably by function, though, of having to deal yeah. with a bunch of dumb dudes. Not so nice people, yeah. 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 So, how do people end up getting into this? So, like I said, you know, reading this book, having sat and chatted with you, 
these kinds of ideas have always seemed fascinating to me, but always out of reach. Mm -hmm. you know, I was always just trying to get enough together to have my own home and maintain it and maybe have a little bit of fun. But I see you constantly alluding to the fact that it's, you know, it's much more attainable mm -hmm. than people think. You know, just right by virtue of you saying like, let's go 30 minutes south, mm -hmm. uh, you can get a lot more for your money and then mm -hmm. you know, tenant multiplication suddenly turns into positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, do you have ideas? I mean, I know it's very place dependent on what mm -hmm. homes cost, but mm -hmm. like, do you have general guidelines of like money people should have in the bank if they want to come and have a discussion with you about starting into this game? I think there's a lot of people that want to do this, right? Yeah. But it, like I usually do buyer consultation, I need to dig around and see exactly why you want to do this. It takes a certain person. It's not, it's not easy. I mean, yes, we call it passive income. Yes, checks come in, but my phone rings at six in the morning. Somebody just shot somebody or if, uh. I mean, there's so much drama. It's not even funny on mm -hmm. the daily basis. I was sitting in your parking lot here for 10 minutes talking to my property manager on drama, you know, so things happen and you have to be involved. When you get further into the book, a lot of the drama is in there and how do you deal with it? Like. Ultimately, this is your business. You own it. These people that you have hired to help you, yes, they will help you, but oftentimes they're not going to want to know how to deal with certain, like, I had somebody shoot themselves. How do you deal with that? Everybody ends up in a panic. Mm -hmm. You got to keep your team calm. You got you got to be calm. Yep. Let's just start there. You got to keep them calm. Has police showed up? Did they remove the body? Like, what's our next step? You know, and you have to talk them through this calmly because everybody's freaking out. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's not passive. Yeah. But I suppose the more units you have, the more drama you have at the end yeah. of the day. We try to minimize it, mm -hmm. but it's in a like, these are people we're dealing with yep. at the end of the day. So And people, being people are messy. People are people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's it's work. It's full time work. I won't lie to you. Mm -hmm. So how much do you want to get involved at the end of the day and how much do you want to do? You know, it takes a certain type of person to do it. But it's great money. I'm not gonna lie. Yes, it's there. And you know, like at the end of the day, I have clients that bought properties when their kids were 10, 13. You know, now it pays for their colleges. Kids are in college, it pays their yeah. tuition. And then when a the kid is done, they might end up selling it and live off of it. Buying a vacation home somewhere. Yeah, and somewhere. And peace out. Peace out. I'm done. I don't want to deal with it. Yep. So there's a lot of different options. I usually like to sit down and talk to people to see what their goals are, so we can align them based on whatever their goal is. Every situation is different. Yeah, I guess I had not considered the fact that it. You know, I when you say it's a full-time job, um, at some point, I assume, you know, somewhere between two or three properties and 20 properties, you know, obviously it, it scales dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, am I to assume then that even, you know, imagine I turn around and buy three duplexes in the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, that's a still a pretty, pretty you'll, large time. Commitment. You'll be, you'll be involved. Yeah. And, like I have a couple of clients that own, you know, like eight doors. And yeah. I swear to God, she has so much drama. I'm like, I don't know if you're creating drama or you just have a dramatic <laughs> tenant. How do you want to react to all that? It's like life is what you pay attention to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, what are we doing here? Figure out your priorities. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if she's just brewing that drama or if she really has that much drama. Generally mm -hmm. speaking, when I run into somebody that has drama around them constantly, they're the common denominator. Probably. It seems to be. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that kind of lends itself to a broader conversation about people's relationship with money. Um, and even uh, thinking about as reading the book, um, it sure seems like one of your superpowers is being able to spot opportunity in chaos. Um, and it, it like as as you read the book over and over again, you're like, oh, you know, I, I saw this opportunity here and I did the hard work and I, I made it successful. And I saw this opportunity here and I did the hard work and I made it a possibility and I made it a real reality. Um, is that, does that occur to you to be like who you feel like you are? 
You're right. I do have that, I guess, hunch uh -huh. about things usually. Yeah. Like when I talk to people, um, you know, I'll do my research, I'll do my own investigation, I'll look at the property deeper, like, can I, what can I do with it? And then like, oh my God, this is a gold mine. There was just a property the other day that you would think was a freaking gold mine, all the numbers penciled out, and I'm like, I'm not buying it. Yeah. I just don't feel right Literally. About it. <laughs> Didn't buy it. Yeah. Did not buy it. Um, I drove by, I mean, at 20% return. I would have to She's be insane. brain dead not to buy it, uh -huh. right? So I'm driving the property, I'm looking at the neighborhood, and I'm like, just something doesn't feel right. A lot of the homes are either crispy burned or falling off the side of the earth. And I'm like, why are they falling off the side of the earth? Something's wrong with the dirt here. Mm -hmm. Foundation issues. I'm like, if this block has foundation issues, it's a matter of time before my block has foundation issues. Yep. It's not always about money. Yeah. And that's going to be a money pit. I'm like, even if they fix this, they build new construction. Now that's a direct competition to my building. Mm -hmm. And now my 20% return on investment that's goes out the window. Yeah. So you have to look at a lot of, you're going to get to that chapter, by the way, <laughs> a lot of different things. Like there is a lot of things that come into play. Yeah. But like, how do you manage to find that opportunity? How do you keep that mindset in such a positive way looking for opportunities when the whole world around you like you said the 2007 2008 market crash like people are running around like chicken little losing their minds and losing their homes and you're able to kind of sit back and go hmm. oh my god had that conversation this morning it's going like, <laughs> she is freaking out full-blown panic mode mm -hmm. we went on a hike i mean she's like she's like i need to go out with you we need to talk i'm like okay what the hell's going on let's go walk <laughs> mm -hmm. full-blown panic mode she's like oh my god the sky's falling recession banks are melting and you know saudi arabia like no longer recognizes dollar and china not recognizing dollar i'm like the hell are you freaking out about? She goes, why are you not freaking out? I'm like, it's opportunity time. Stop flipping. Like, mm -hmm. What the hell are you freaking out about? She's like, oh, I didn't look at it from that angle. I'm mm -hmm. like, you've been wanting to buy for the longest time. This is your opportunity. Right. Get in there. We, like, what are we doing? Why are we panicking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this look at it from a different angle. How can, like, there's money to be made in every market. Like, how can I make money? Yeah. Sure. Let them panic. Let them freak out. I never buy when market is high. I, the majority of my stuff I bought during COVID, and I mean in the middle of COVID, mm -hmm. no one else was buying. Yeah. People thought I was mad. Well, and that story in the book, the very first story about, you know, the snowstorm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, like, taking – I had never in my wildest dreams thought that that would be a great time to go look at house listings. Nobody like, else is looking. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Right? Competitions at home bundled up especially if it's like the beginning of a you know week-long snow streak like oh yeah let's let's do this i was I, I was salivating over that place it was paper thin walls a piece of shit out of 1930s <laughs> my husband's like mm, i don't know about this building i'm like i kind of like this piece of shit <laughs> those are the exact words i used i kind of like this piece of shit he goes, what are we going to do? Like, We're going to fix it? We're going to put tenants? We're going to keep it till the day we die? Yeah. I mean, I didn't keep it till the day. No. no. <laughs> Two years later, what did I pay for it? I paid 118 I sold it two years later and about 13 units. Yeah. What? Right? Uh-huh. You turned a single unit into 13. T duplex You turned a duplex 13. into 13. Yeah. On the same cash? I took my cash plus a little bit. I think we, I can't remember what I made, maybe 150, 180 off of it. So that was my down payment for a 13 unit complex that was 410, 450 I paid for it. But that 13 unit was a crack house. Oh, good times. But it's not anymore. But I was okay with the crack house. <laughs> <laughs> crack houses pay. They, I, again, who is your team behind you? Can they take it to the finish line? Yep. Who are your people? I knew I had solid people. I wasn't worried about whatever issues that came up on the inspection. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, bring it up. We had foundation issues. We had 
lots all of stuff, the issues. everything, yeah. <laughs> electrical, plumbing, everything, roof, like all the major components of right. the house needed to go. Check, 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 check. We were all done. Everybody, check, within three check, months, check, check, check. <laughs> within three months, we have the whole place and um, refinanced it and got my money out. Yeah. Wow. Look at things differently, I suppose, is what, like, if your listeners can get something out of it, like, don't do what everybody else is doing. When everybody else is panicking, that's the time. That's the time. Going. Like, everybody's mm. freaking out right now. I'm like, sweet. Right? right. For me, like, especially in the, the single family uh, home game right now, with interest rates the way they are, mm -hmm. it's like, ooh, it seems like a terrible time to buy because... I mean, they're still way lower than they've been historically, mm -hmm. but, you know, compared to the 2 and 3% that was available, you know, 18 months ago, mm -hmm. I don't even know, what are we at now? Six, six and, and, a, half, and a half, six mm -hmm. and a quarter, depends on, yeah, yeah, credit and whatever not, but... The mm -hmm. number of people I know that, like, literally have cash sitting in their account, they were ready to buy, they waited, the rates went up, and now they're just going to sit on this cash, it's like... Do you want to know what's happening in the market right now? I do. Uh -huh. I'm about to not, I really I'm, do. You're about to be shocked. Um, listed something on the east side maybe two weeks ago. Ended up with five offers. Every single person was cash. Wow. And I mean cash in the account. Ten million, five million, four million. Are these local? They have to, oh, they're local. No, no, they're local. Wow. They're local. And... I think what's happening. I feel right very now, inadequate right now. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell am I doing wrong? Right? Where's my cash? Teach me. Yeah. I know. Um, I think what's happening right now, and it's not just that one property. I have another property um, west of here. Same thing, got an offer, all cash. And then I'm talking to other agents that are competing. I'm on the listing side of it. And they're complaining, a couple of them were financing. They're like, I competed against six other homes that we've written offers on, and we lost to all cash buyers. Yeah, because why wouldn't you? You will. Every so time. what's happening is a lot of these buyers or people that are sitting on cash with all the banks melting down, they don't want their cash to sit in a bank, so they're putting it in the uh, assets. Uh, uh, I haven't and spoken of this before, so hot tips. So I think the market is like real estate market is where you can dump it and be safe. It's a hedge against inflation mm -hmm. also, right? Yep. Um, so that's what I'm seeing a lot of at the moment. Interesting. Well, I mean, if you want to go ahead and get us, you know, an, an offer, you know, all cash for a million over, mm -hmm. like, we, we can talk. <laughs> and that's actually what happened. A million happened. over? A million, million. Well, a million, a million uh -huh. over is what I got on the, yeah. one of the homes on the east side. If we yeah. went and offered it up at what it's worth and then got a million over that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Also. Yeah. Oh, well, well, and I saw an article in, uh, they were talking about a house in Bridal Trails that also, like, I think it was, think a, it was a year million. and a half ago was also a million over asking price. Just like, Those were financed back a year and a half ago. Right. We saw a lot of financed offers. Uh -huh. Finance buyers are not having a hard time getting in. Mm -hmm. They're losing to all cash buyers oh, yeah. right now. And I'm not talking all cash that's from overseas cash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This and is that's cash, cash that's local cash. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, I know we live in this, you know, big tech world mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of great money here, but, you know, a crappy needs a ton of work rambler in this area is a million bucks. Yeah. That's dirt. Is mm -hmm. what you're paying yeah, for. You're paying for the yeah. property. Yeah. Um, and, you know, nice homes, like when we're sitting in, you know, mm -hmm. two and a half to five million bucks. It's like for most people, it's just, even Nothing. for us, it's, it's like, like sure. how? <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting what's happening to watch it unfold right now, but everybody's waiting for the market to melt. I don't know if we'll see that yet necessarily because of all the folks that are sitting on cash that don't want their money sitting in the bank. Yeah. yeah. So market has picked up all over. Man, and talk about a vote of no confidence for the banks. Ooh. And here's another interesting fact. Talked to a commercial lender yesterday. They got a letter of intent. They got the property and the contract all the feasibility, everything's done, they get to the finish line and the bank's like, just kidding, we're not going to lend you. Oh, no. We're seeing that now. Oh, so they're like, mm, maybe it's not worth So it. there's 
something's happening. I don't know what. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll get back to you on what that is. (laughs) It's definitely an opportunity. It's an opportunity time for sure. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. How do we how do how do we talk about that shift? Because we're you know the goal of this interview and this podcast is to talk about relationship with money, and obviously you're talking about looking at things from a different perspective, um, which is a really, really big part of all of it, Mm -hmm. you know, but then what? That, I don't even know what to do with that. Um, (laughs) Making that connection back, it it is a struggle for me um, because I'm focusing on it more from, you know, if you don't have what you perceive as enough money, um, it can really make your life pretty terrible. and everyone seems to think that, you know, being rich makes you happy. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've known a ton of people, and I suspect, tell me if I'm wrong, that everybody at this table will tell you over a certain number, you mm-hmm. know, in this area, I'd say, I don't know, low 100,000s or so. Um, once you get to that, the difference between that and 10 million is just more opportunity, more stuff. But, you know, your quality of life doesn't necessarily, it's like, you're not worried about having a home, you're not worried about mm-hmm. having a nice car, maybe taking some vacations. I guess what I wanted, you know, I guess we've already explored it is how do people start to break into this? How do they take the little bits of money they have and move forward towards a goal of like, hey, I do want to go and make some investments that potentially are going to produce passive income for me Mm -hmm. with some work associated with Mm -hmm. it, obviously. Um, But, you know, how does somebody that has a $10,000 nest egg sitting around? It'll it'll be hard to make $10,000. Do, do much. Do much. Well, especially in this area. Especially in this, this area. area. Perhaps look at buying out of state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at buying out of state. Say states like Ohio, for example, yeah. you can get um I mean I've seen things for fifty, seventy thousand, which is enough yeah. for you to do a down payment. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And then cash flow may be seven, eight hundred dollars a month at the end of the day. You gotta start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But it has to be you have to be in the right mindset. It has to be you need to want to do this. Yeah. You know, you and I can sit here and talk all we want, but if they don't want to do it, yeah. we're not no. gonna get anywhere oh, at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, there's some people that will get you into greatness and get you all hyped up and excited yeah. for two, three days, but then you're going to come home and not do anything about it. Yeah. Right? So you need to, as a investor, they're going to need to want to do that. How do you deal with that from, a, you know, my idea of an out-of-state, you know, I'm kind of a, at least historically a do-it-yourself guy. I, I do a lot of my own home repair type mm-hmm. of stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm trying not to anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we can get into that. Um, but the idea of an out-of-state concept is, you know, hey, uh, the washing machine exploded or this or that. Uh, if you have to, you know, if you don't have a team in place, mm-hmm. you're either going there yourself to deal with it mm-hmm. or you're potentially hiring somebody that you've not worked with. Mm-hmm. Um, if you haven't built that team relationship, mm-hmm. you know, do you have thoughts and tips about how you want to address that? So if you do want to invest out-of-state, before you even do anything, I recommend you fly out there, have a team in place, like, and I'm talking real estate agents, property managers, landscapers, everybody. I'm going to cough. Sorry. You're all good. <laughs> We're going to cut this off. We'll chop that out. We'll chop it off. Um, uh, get your team in place. Interview as many people as you can. See if you two mesh well together. And, you know, your goals align. And if your goals align and if the moon and the stars align, then I would say, you know, now you're safe to buy that property. But before you set up your team, you can't really buy anything. And yeah. that's, I think that's a key that's piece a key of information piece. there. Well, and utilizing your network, right? Mm-hmm. If if you have enough of a network to have people who have tendrils in different places mm-hmm. to say, oh, yeah, you know, this market mm-hmm. is really, really hot or not. It's interesting. We have a friend who... Picked up, left Microsoft, and uh, bought a house, basically sight unseen in Pittsburgh for sixty four thousand dollars. Cute little place, um, you know. The the it was fast. It was like mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. Um, and the the uh, the agent actually like walked her through with a video tour, but that was all she had. And right, but the like the faith and the risk and the like, 
excitement of taking that on and seeing what you get. But what they do. Um, very well. She moved into that place like as her personal residence, yeah. did she not? Yeah. yeah. Huh. Thought so. So not even as a rental, but yeah, I mean, just talk about jumping off a cliff and taking a risk, man. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. With mm-hmm. a home, the number of things that can go wrong is, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm a little more paranoid than that. Yeah. yeah. As well, I think people should be. Conservative, <laughs> I believe, is the word that I heard mm-hmm. uh, referred to you as. <laughs> conservative, yeah. I'm mm-hmm. a lot more conservative. Which makes good sense, you know, especially when you're dealing in, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars at a time. Something goes wrong, that's... I need to be able to see it, yeah. And, like, even when we go to our inspections... So the last time I bought um, 58 units, you know, we inspected it. I can't remember. We started at 9 a.m. He had maybe four or five inspectors through. They were done within two hours. Well, one guy was going through the roof. One guy was going through the crawl space. And then we have two guys coming from this angle, this angle. <laughs> Meet in the middle. <laughs> Meet in the middle through all the units. And I don't care that. Cabinets are scratched. I don't care if the walls are scratched. Any major components, mm-hmm. plumbing, electrical. Roof. Anybody foundation. falling through the floors? We're done. Yep. Let's yep. go. Mm-hmm. You know? Thank you. We're buying a rental. Like my inspections, next. That's how we do it. Yeah. Wow. How much of that do you think is just your gut and knowing? You could tell usually when you walk in. And if tenants are there, they will tell you what's wrong with the house. Yeah. Oh, they like to chat. <laughs> <laughs> My like Get them my, talking, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. my heat doesn't work, my AC does not work, and there's like roaches everywhere. Like they tell you everything. Oh, interesting. I never considered that that uh sellers want you to get the best possible picture and the renters are like i'm gonna tell it to you straight i'm gonna show you everything wrong hi (laughs) sir how are you doing today is everything working let me tell you something (laughs) (laughs) oh do tell i'm all yours spill the tea yes Mm -hmm. tell us so there's ways of doing it and oftentimes i tell my clients it's like okay we're gonna walk in and you're gonna say nothing because the minute you do now you just took that opportunity away from them of us getting the intel. <laughs> like, yeah. you don't talk. Right. That's all I'm asking you to do. Shh. Shh. Quiet. Would you guys like an alcoholic beverage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. It was some crazy stuff we've heard. Some crazy stories. <laughs> it's, uh, some of them I read in the book, uh, and then I've, I've got a, a lifelong friend who uh, helped me with some real estate deals in the past, Teresa. Um, who, yeah, hearing some of her stories as well. And she also jumped into the market at a really tenuous time and then decided that she wanted to take on, you know, repos, Mm -hmm. uh, just terrible property, Mm -hmm. falling down, Mm -hmm. you know, people living in there that are violent, just Mm -hmm. the good stuff, you Mm -hmm. know. That's where the money's at, usually. Mm -hmm. Seems seems like she did well for herself. so. So the properties, they usually break them in A, B, C, D, and F is like, you're going to get shot in the face type of building, right? Mm. F means failed. Yeah. <laughs> that means <laughs> run. F means run. <laughs> <laughs> so your A's are similar to like Lincoln Square, Braeburn type yeah. of buildings, like your new construction stuff. Beautiful. You know, like nice, beautiful amenities. Everything's there. Doorman, whatever. Everything should everything, work. Everything should be working. And you're paying for it. Mm-hmm. Those typically don't make you money. Yeah. You're buying it for appreciation. Yep. And then you've got your big buildings that are built in like 80s, 90s. They're okay, but they're kind of like a little tired, but still good quality tenants you're attracting in there, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And I'm usually after C and or D that I can turn into C plus or B. Ah, okay. You know, you go in there. I'll upgrade them. Exactly. And mm-hmm. you put better tenants in there and now you have... Clean up the mess. Exactly. That nobody wants to touch. (laughs) Yeah. And then the, you know, the mayor thanks you for your service. Yeah, yeah. Uh We've had that happen too. (laughs) (laughs) Sheriffs showed up and they thank this for turning it around because that's less work for them to do. They don't have to circle that property as much. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have to show up for drama all the time. And you're putting good vibes back into the Exactly. Into community. And now, like, we had one property, um, we had a lot of riffraff in. And she called me the other day. She's like, oh, yeah, kids are running around and they're biking again. That just warms my heart. Oh, I was like, yes, yes. we did it. <laughs> nice. Because that's always a good Canary indication that you yeah. finally cleaned it up. Yeah. They feel safe enough they feel safe to let their kids, to let their kids run around. 
Yep. Oh, I love that. That is awesome. So that's that usually warms my heart. I'm like, oh, exciting, we did it. Yeah. It's the good stuff. Yeah. Well, and it was interesting. Um, totally like segue that doesn't make any sense, but my brain was going there, and it's been that kind of day. So, um, you know, thinking of uh, I was on Instagram, uh, and I've managed to mine my feed so that it's basically just all of this cool inspirational stuff. But one of the things that someone was talking about was your relationship with money and how you think about your relationship with money. And uh, if you talked about going on a date with someone, like a first date, the way that you talk about money, how would that look? And like, you know, saying something like, oh, money's the root of all evil, or there's never enough of it, or it always causes me problems, or this or that. Like, if you said that about your date on a first date, they wouldn't want to be around you. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, all right, peace out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to change the way that you think about money and the way that you think about how it affects your life and treating it like it's something precious and mm -hmm. not something to be reviled or, mm -hmm. or problematic. So do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know if I ever thought about it that way, but I suppose I do. Yeah. In a way, mm -hmm. I just didn't connect things like that. Yeah, it was the first time that I had thought about it too, where I was like, huh. Yeah. I don't think it's root cause of all evil, but at the end of the day, it gives you flexibility and freedom. It's not going to buy you happiness. No, never. By any means. Yeah, and but I'd like not, to let it try. <laughs> you know? And it's not going to, like, we've had a couple people that we lost along the way, you know, to illnesses and yeah. to disasters. And at the end of the day, no money in the world would have bought their health. No. So I usually tell like, and I've been trying to break this evil cycle with some of my relatives of like, you need to get out and take vacations and spend time with your family. Yeah. Like the other day, my kids and I, Nathan was visiting from college. I was like, you guys want to go to Disney? And Joe goes, I'm working. I was like, well, peace out. We're out. Continue working. <laughs> it hasn't clicked to him yet. I know I'm shitting on him. He's going to hate it. But, <laughs> to me, they're only gonna want to hang out with me for so long so i would run mm -hmm. yes money's great yes because i have money i have this flexibility and that freedom but i am grateful and i'm thankful that i have that opportunity and freedom to spend this time with my kids like people sometimes bitch and complain that the plumbing is clogged i'm like that means you have food on your table yeah yeah that's what that means yeah like that's excellent that's a great problem to have now call the plumber and get it unplugged mm -hmm. I think that like growing up where I grew up and not having access to a lot of these things, I always look at things from a different angle. Yeah. You know, so to me, I'm grateful. I'm like, sweet, my plumbing's clogged. That means I fed you all really well. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fiber. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But people just like seeing like the negative, just like stop draining yourself. Yeah. Like, change your mindset. Mm -hmm. Investing doesn't always have to do with money. Just like no. you said, you're investing time in your family and your kids. and yeah. Exactly. Spend time with your family. Like one oh. of our friends, her husband just collapsed and died in front of her. Oh. He that morning got up and he's like, hey, let's go grab beer. And she's like, no, I'm going to take girls to football, I think, that evening. And when she came home at 10, he's like, I'm having an adjustment. I'm having an adjustment. And then he just How passed away. It? Yikes. 57. <sighs> Young. And to this day, she will not forgive herself. She's like, I should have gone and grabbed beer with him. I mean, mm. she still spent time with her girls, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and it's, yeah. it's you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right now is all Enjoy you your family, hug your family, right. kiss your family, spend time with them. And yep. I know plenty of people that make 50000 a year. They're plenty happy. Yeah. We have a number of friends, obviously, in this area that are very well to do. And ironically, I see very little correlation between the amount of money you have in the bank or accessible to you mm -hmm. and, and your happiness. Mm -hmm. It's it's a mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the second you pull gratitude into it, there's a direct it correlation. Changes, yeah. yeah. Everything. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question or did I just get off track? No, I, 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 you <laughs> absolutely did. And, and I, it's, uh, I wish we could teach that shift in perspective that comes from maybe having a, a different background, you know, like you, you grew up obviously much, much differently than I did, but I grew up um, with not a lot either. And it really, it lends and 
it lends itself to being able to see things in a different way. And I always joke, I can spot the silver lining on a mushroom cloud. Like <laughs> I can, I can find the good stuff in just about anything. Cause yeah, I've lived through some stuff. So it's not that we were poor. We actually had money, mm -hmm. but when Soviet Union fell apart, there was no food in the stores. Yeah. So we had no food right. to eat mm -hmm. at the end of the day. You know, my dad, would, he was, um, he used to work in a factory. He would make clothes for men, like suits and pants and things like that. So my brother and my dad would go to a, you know, market. They would sell clothes and then come home on a Sunday with the bag full of money and a table like this. We would unload it, and my job was to like sort it out. And we're like sitting there counting. I'm really good at counting money. <laughs> 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 we had all the money, but we had nothing to buy with it. Well, that's, like I said, you know, the same thing. As you know good, yeah. at the end of the day. When I'm starving to death, it doesn't really matter. As you know really good. Yeah. can't throw it in the, in the fireplace and set it on fire and stay warm. Exactly. Not for long, anyway. I think one of the stories I have in my book is um, we were, you know, trying to make bread. I think flour or whatever my mom had was in the garage, and we were sifting bugs out of the flour you know, to, for her to make bread, and the flour was, I mean, the bread was bitter mm -hmm. from what we think was bug poop is what we were eating. Yeah. I mean, did we eat it? Absolutely. There was yeah. nothing Pretty else hungry. to eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You dip it in milk and Meal you go. yeah. You find them in the, in the flour, and even, I, I remember the same thing in, like, grade school, accepting like, through the flour and being like, oh, God, there are bugs in here. What mm -hmm. do we do with that? And you're like, well, we're not going to throw away through, five pounds of flour just because, like, it's protein. There you go. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's how you look at things at the end of the day. You mm -hmm. know, like, be grateful. Yeah. Grateful. Gratitude. Huge. Big deal. Yeah. It's yeah. a game changer. Well, when do we uh, when do we expect to see this book? I you know we got to read a little pre-release thing. When when are we seeing yeah, this? Fancy, fancy. I've been saying it a week from now so for the past three months. <laughs> <laughs> Any day, <laughs> Any day. So design is done. Well, editing is done. Design of the cover book is done. Um, formatting is all done. That's the one you were reading, the mm -hmm. final formatted version of it. I'm technically going to be uh, putting it up this week. Amazon? Yes. But I have to make sure the uh, author copy looks legit. Yeah. So there's no bugs, so, you know, it's not bleeding onto the backside of it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, before it's published, but a How week. Exciting. I'm, I'm hoping a week. All right. No. So, folks, are going to be looking for real estate investing, nothing held back. So by the time this airs, probably it will be ready. Actually, it probably should be live because yeah, this will probably be a week, two weeks before. Oh, there you have it. Mm -hmm. We should be ready by then. Yeah, and um, how do you pronounce your last name? Just so it's Caleb. Caleb. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Nelia Caleb. Yeah. On Amazon, on Ingram Sparks. I'm hoping we can get it into Barnes and Noble. I'm excited. I'm not doing it to make money, by the way. Yeah. I mean, sure. Sure. Great, but you ain't gonna make money off of like yeah. five dollars. I might, who knows? Yeah. Are you going to do know. any book signings? I am going to do book signings. Um, I'm hoping, I talked to Barnes & Noble here at Crossroads. Mm -hmm. They actually promote local authors, yeah. believe it or not. Yes. yes. Yeah, so they're all game. Well, and we might know somebody who... We, uh, we know some folks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we know someone who knows someone. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Raji that we just had on the show not too long ago um, had a book signing up at the um, Side Hustle in Kirkland. Oh, she's um, also done Barnes and Noble a couple places. Yeah, so she's she's got a, a list of people that she's been dealing with, but yeah, we we might know some people. Perhaps we'll uh, sync you up with some. For some sure, I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. I'm always excited to meet others. Oh, us too. <laughs> yeah, people are. Oh, I love people. I love talking to people. Yeah, so nice we actually kind of change your life. Went to a cool event last night and met a ton of cool folks. So that's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. Absolutely, thanks really for having me. Really appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, we'll have you back post uh, post book release to yeah. talk more about how it's been received and how things are going, and maybe you can give us more little tips and tricks for. Yeah, there's there's ideas for second book now floating. Oh, I love Wait, it. I forgot this. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> As always, folks, thanks for being with us. Be well. Much love and peace. Stay elevated. Thanks. Thank you.